So uh, I think we get ready. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, which is Martin Mehrager. He comes from Nijmegen University. And uh, as a story, very quick introduction, Bas Gottens, uh, he from the Rathaus University in Utrecht, which is a sort of French Catholic University at the time, 2006. Uh, then he transitioned to Berlin to his Harvard Institute, which is a lead uh, institute in, in, uh, in Germany. It's a Max Planck Institute, and he was there for, I think, uh, from 2006 to 2011, so six or seven years, first as a postdoc, and then uh, as a group leader. <laughs> and then he went back to, uh, to Nijmegen to take up uh, first a uh, position as an assistant, a tenure track position, and maybe this is of interest to the young people. Only three years later, he was a good professor. I think it's pretty nice. <laughs> and I can talk a long time about all his uh, scientific acknowledgement, prestigious prizes and grants, and not to mention his, his favorite uh, journals of uh, conferences in space and nature, journals and science. That's all nice. But what I really want to say is that I think he's a fantastic scientist, and hopefully this will show at today's talk. You see? So, this is what you like. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, and, and what I really enjoyed, I know he's in like, 2003, 2004, and we always have fantastic scientific discussion. And that's really what it's all about. And then one thing which I hope will also be clear in this talk is that the ability to build unusual scientific instruments opens possibilities for making extraordinary science, and I think we will tell us about that. So, with that, please pass go ahead, and I hope this is not even for you. So, well, thank, you. well, thank you very much, Henrik, uh, for this very nice introduction and for the invitation to come to the uh, to tell about the work we do in Nijmegen. And I apologize for all the delays. Um, actually, turning on these laptops and connecting them to this uh, to the system so made it actually look more difficult than manipulating molecules in the laboratory. Uh, anyway, so the work that we do in Nijmegen is we're really passionate about trying to, to understand collisions between molecules and atoms. You know? I hope to make clear is we develop some unique technology actually to manipulate molecules in order to do this in very high level of precision. So why are we so interested in molecular collisions? Well, there are a number of reasons. The first reason is this happens all around us, right? So if you want to understand the world around us, whether it be in atmospheric chemistry, in combustion, or even in astrochemistry, you really need to know how molecules collide with each other, because ultimately this will be an input in order to try to understand the macroscopic behavior of these bulk systems. But there's a second reason, and that is that molecules and atoms, when they collide, this is like an ultimate probe for quantum mechanics or quantum chemistry, because a molecule and an atom obviously is a quantum object. And if you study them in complete isolation from any environment, you really have a good handle of trying to test quantum mechanical methods and theories. And this is what we really would like to do. So ultimately, we would like to get, like, as we call it, a full understanding of these quantum mechanical systems. And with a full understanding, I mean that we would like to be able to write down the Hamiltonian from first principles, solve the equations, and then accurately describe and predict the behavior of molecules when they collide. And where do we stand in this field at the moment? Well, actually, we are not that good at this. So this full understanding at the moment is really only possible for the very simplest of systems. Basically, a simple diatomic molecule scattering with an atom. Only then can we get this complete understanding of the theory is almost exact. But if we step up the complexity better, only one step, and we place this atom for another molecule, the equations will become so difficult that we cannot really solve them. And so this is, of course, an issue. And also for me, this is kind of bizarre because we're living in the year 2023. We can do crazy things in science, right? We can detect gravitational waves. We can make a photograph of a black hole. But a simple collision between two oxygen molecules, we cannot accurately describe and predict from first principles in quantum mechanics. And this is actually the situation that is out there already for a long, long, long time, basically from the start of quantum mechanics. So here you see a citation by Paul Mirakel that he made in 1939, where he says that the fundamental laws necessary for the mathematical treatment of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known. And the difficulty lies only in the fact that the application of these laws leads to equations that are far too complex to be solved. 
And so the problem is not that we don't understand the fundamental physics or fundamental chemistry. Everything is in principle known. We know all the interactions, so we can write down the full Hamiltonian. Our problem is just mathematics. We don't know how to solve these equations to actually get a proper description of these systems. And this is still true up to today. And so how do we make advancement in this field? Well, this is basically by a synergy between experiment and theory. So what experimentalists try to do is build ever more complex instruments in order to really look in high detail how these molecules collide with each other and what is the output of such a collision. Which then, of course, can be fed back into the theory, so theoreticians calculate what they expect, and of course, you compare with your experimental findings. And by looping this thing over and over again, you ever get deeper into this full understanding and the full description of these quantum systems. And here you see you on the eve of the Nobel Prize for the development of the cross molecular beam techniques. He's standing here in front of this universal cross beam machine in Berkeley. I think this photo must be from the 70s or so. But really, the workhorse in this field is the use of molecular beams. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with molecular beams, but basically what you do in a molecular beam is you take a container of high pressure gas in your vacuum system, and you have a small leak in that container, such that molecules can actually travel out. And because they travel into vacuum, they expand. And as they expand, they cool down all their degrees of freedom. And in this expanding jet, you can basically take the center core of this by the skimmer, you basically form this molecular beam. So this is just a stream of molecules where all these molecules more or less have the same speed and they are internally cooled down to their lowest rotation and operation states. And so this is really the workhorse in many of these types of experiments. And in this cross beam machine, machines, you basically take two of those molecular beams under some angle and right at the crossing point uh, of these two molecular beams, you really get the real collision experiment. So that's where you have collisions between molecules in complete isolation from anything else, and also the beauty of this technique that molecules can only scatter a maximum one time. So you really see very individual collisions again if you probe these collisions in high detail. So this is basically a, uh, the, 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 yeah, uh, what's out there in the field already for, for many years, and many people have contributed to this, leading to our current knowledge of molecular collisions. But there's a second argument. So this was important already for decades, but the last two, one or two decades or so, another argumentation, uh, argument, argument came about to measure these molecular gate collisions. And that is to try to measure these collisions at very low temperatures. And this is illustrated here. If you measure these collisions or probe them at high temperatures, you basically have, well, still, still a quantum object, but still you can get a far away with just Newtonian mechanics. You can treat your molecules and atoms as being like billiard balls that scatter on a billiard table. And although, of course, you need proper mechanics to get a full answer of what you're doing, but with these mechanical laws, you get a far away. Um, but of course, this is completely not true if you cool everything down to very low temperatures. This is where quantum mechanics really starts kicking in. As you all know, as the temperature drops, the Brier wavelength of particles becomes larger and larger. And at some point, the wavelengths of these metal waves that you have, they are so large that they really start dominating everything in this collision. And so then instead of having billiard balls that are colliding with each other, which is basically yeah, what you're used to at a billiard table, right? They come together and they, they knock into a certain direction. Now you have two waves coming together. And two waves coming together and colliding, well, this leads to a fundamental different interaction. Waves can interfere. And of course, it's very interesting to see this interfering quantum waves during these molecular collisions that you observe them. This is much like throwing a stone in a pond, where you see ripples on the water surface by throwing a stone in. And I chose this image here because it's basically the images that we can make nowadays from these colliding molecules in this very cold regime, and I'll show you later in my talk, they pretty much resemble such an image from the water surface where you throw the stone in it. And from this distribution of basically these wave forms that you see here, you can directly trace back what kind of quantum mechanical waves are underlying the collision. And so that will be something that we'll show you later. And so let's go a little bit more in detail. So the quest for these low collision energies. What kind of things can we expect when we are that goal? Well, one of the things is really the emergence of new phenomena that simply do not occur at high collision energies. And one of these states, I think it's fair to call this like one of the holy grails in this field for, for a number of years, is the observation of so-called scattering resonances. So here you see a prediction for these kind of scattering resonances for CO molecules, carbon monoxide, scattering with helium. 
Uh, and you see this type of resonance in all kinds of systems. And so this is a theoretical prediction, so it's, it's calculated. And what you see here on the horizontal axis is the collision energy in wave numbers. Now, one wave number is about one Kelvin, so this is kind of a Kelvin scale here. And the vertical axis is the cross section for collision to occur. So just the probability that these things are scattered in each other. Yeah. And what you now see is if you go from these uh, higher energies all the way down to lower energies, at specific energies here, you see the cross section all of, all of a sudden go up tremendously. You get these spikes. Well, this is what we call these resonances. I'll come back to this later. But these resonances, they really occur because at these energies where these resonances occur, you do have individual partial waves that all of a sudden dominate the whole scattering. And so this is where you can actually start seeing the influence of these individual partial waves. And this is what people have been interested in for a long time. But it's also clear to, to be able to observe this experimentally is actually very hard. Because first of all, you need to go to these very low collision energies, or a few Kelvin, not so easy to get there. Uh, but most of importantly, you also need to have a, a very high resolution as you scan your energy in the energy regime. Well, if you undersample these, these, these very narrow features, you easily uh, do not observe them. So you also need a very high resolution to get there. Well, once you have measured these resonances, the energy is now so cold that actually you can start tuning these resonances with external field. The idea is that if you now apply an external electric or magnetic field to the system, where the zeta of start energy can be now the same order of, of the collision energy. Well, then of course we'll start moving around all these resonances and we can start manipulating these collision constants. So this is what people are very interested in. If you go even colder, people are also very interested in other things. You can, for instance, use these cold polar molecules, in particular when you have a dipole mode, and you can store them in optical lattice. And they actually use all these molecules stored in these lattice, uh, lattice points here, basically as a simulator for many body physics. You basically have created here your own icing model where you can start manipulating individual molecules at each of these lattice sites and then look at, uh, well, look at how the system then evolves and compare that to the field. People are very excited about molecules that have a dipole moment. I'll also come back to that later in my talk, where this dipole dipole interaction is very long range, so molecules start feeling each other already at a very large distance. But it's also very highly anisotropic. So it really means what is the relative orientation of the two dipoles when they scatter. This really determines the outcome of the collision. You can start tuning your interaction from attractive to repulsive simply by changing the relative orientation of the two dipoles. So many people are working on doing that too. And there are even some proposals for using ultra cold polar molecules in quantum computation. So the idea is if you take a whole array of those molecules, each having a dipole moment, you can use these molecules basically as a qubit in quantum computation schemes. So there's a lot of, um, well, this field is really uh, maybe a little bit you know, exploding in the last few years, so people are very interested uh, in these ultra cold quantum. Okay, so we are not that cold in our experiments, we are more in this uh, regime where you can see the scattering resonance that I'll show you later. So, back to uh, like a simple cartoon of a, of a scattering experiment. So, if you'd like to really scatter these molecules at a very high precision with each other. Well, if you think about it, what do you need to do? Well, there are two sides of a metal here. You, before the collision, of course, you need to have some control over your molecule, such that you exactly know what you send in. You'd like to be able to control the internal degrees of freedom of your molecule, but also the external degrees of freedom. Basically, you'd like to be able to control their velocity, the relative orientation, and so forth. Well, then you let those molecules collide in this control condition, and then something happens to those molecules, they change due to the collision, and you need to be able to read out the change that occurred to those molecules using a certain detection technique. And so, what has now been so far basically the bottleneck uh, in these cross beam experiments to really make a step forward? The bottleneck has not so much been on the right hand side of this diagram, the detection. Nowadays, there are really fancy laser based detection techniques that basically allows you to measure all the properties of molecules that are relevant like the internal quantum state, uh, even the deflection of the molecules in velocity space that occur due to the collision can be directly measured. And actually we use in our experiments a very nice technique, which is called velocity net imaging. Uh, some of you may have, may have uh, heard of it, or actually using it in the lab that we see today. Uh, but of course, being from Nijmegen, I'm going to describe it well, this is a Nijmegen invention, that was invented by David Parker in 1997. And this really allows you to really basically measure everything of the molecules you'd like to know. It's laser based, so you get quantum state specifically, uh, but also you measure directly this deflection from the initial velocity vector. So basically, it maps all the velocities of the molecules on the two dimensional plane. So, 
This part of the medal is basically salt. Techniques are there that can be used. The problem really is in this preparation. So these molecular beam techniques that I showed you earlier, this cross beam technique, these molecular beams are great, they are nice, but all the molecules in those beams, they still do different things. Some molecules go faster, some molecules go slower, there's a certain angular spread. So this is certainly not sufficient in order to map out these resonances as I showed you before. So this is where we need to work on and to be able to control our molecules better. And then you look back in history and you think about what physicists have been doing over the last well, 100 years or so in controlling particles and scattering them scattering. And this is really impressive. So physicists have learned to control particles really basically changing their temperature or energy by about 25 orders of magnitude. Right? The highest energies can be made with charged particle accelerators. And we all know, of course, the example of well, the Hadron, Large Hadron Collider at CERN, but also here in Arbus, you have this, this, this storage rings with ions. And so it's actually relatively easy to manipulate the ions because you can just use the Coulomb force. And you can even speed them up to velocities closer to the speed of, speed of light. All the way on the other end of the extreme, the coldest temperatures can be made with ultra cold atoms, where lasers can be used to really cool down atoms to temperatures well, close to nano kelvins nowadays. And this actually leads to even the formation of new states of matter like the Bose Einstein technique. So. so all these kinds of things have been developed to manipulate particles, and of course great science has been done with all of those techniques. But where do our molecules fit in? Yeah, so our molecules are neutral, they don't have a charge. So in principle, charged particle accelerators cannot be used for our molecules. We have the same problem with laser cooling. Laser cooling really only works for atoms. Nowadays there are a few molecules that have been laser cooled still, which is very difficult and not suitable for our type of experiment. So basically, none of these techniques can be used for neutral molecules, and we have to really design back in the drawing board and design new methods from scratch. Although we can be inspired by one of these methods, in particular, these Linux, these charge particle accelerators. And so the question you can ask yourself is, can we now also control neutral molecules in systems like the linear accelerator, uh, but then, of course, the problem is our molecules do not have charge. So the Coulomb force that we use in those enoxes is zero for our molecules. But there's a second order effect. If you take a molecule that doesn't have a charge with a dipole moment, you can still exert a force on the molecule. So this basically dates back to the Stern Gerlach experiment in 1922. The idea is that you take a molecule that has a dipole moment, and if you place that into an inhomogeneous electric field, you basically see that there is a netto force pointing in this case to the left that wants to pull the molecules in towards this direct capacitor place. And so there is certainly a force on a dipolar molecule that you can use to manipulate its motion. It is just that this force is very small. So if you compare the forces that you have on a charge, like in a linear accelerator for a charge particle, you see that the force acting on a dipole moment of a molecule is about nine orders of magnitude smaller. So you can do exactly the same manipulation to neutral polar molecules, as you can do to charged particles, you can do accelerators, bunches, synchrotrons, storage rings, you can do it all. You just have to work nine orders of magnitude hard. <laughs> Luckily, it's not nine orders of magnitude more expensive. And this is what we do in this stock accelerator. So I'm not going to explain in too much detail how this device it really, really works in detail, but basically it's a whole series of highly polished stainless steel electrodes. Um, that you pulse to high voltage such that molecules that fly through these electrodes, they always feel a force from behind and they continuously sped up, uh, or they always feel a force opposing their motion and then they continuously slow down. And so basically the take-home message from this device is that it adds a knob to your molecular beam machine that you can turn on and you can dial in any velocity that you wish, ranging from very high velocities all the way down to the standstill. And so, because this whole device works on wraps on the stark effect of a molecule, you also get a very high state purity in this beams, you get a very narrow velocity spread and a very small angular spread. And so the combination of all these properties really makes this beams uh, an excellent starting point for collision experiments, in particular cross scattering. And also again, I run from Nijmegen, I'm proud to say that it's also the Nijmegen invention this time by Gerard Meyer in nineteen fifty nine. And so it's really the combination of these two techniques that make very high resolution experiments possible.
So back to our diagram of what, what do we want to achieve in such an experiment. The control now of the particle is being done by the stark accelerator, and this reading out of the collision product is being done by the SDF imaging. So this is the best of both worlds, I think, and now it's almost like the nine of the worlds. Anyway, so this is then how it more or less looks. So we produce a molecular beam with our stark accelerator, uh, which is then crossed here at the center point by a conventional beam of epigenal molecules at any angle, at any 90 degree, 180 degree, or a small angle. And then we do this cross net imaging. Uh, I don't want to say too much about how, how it works, but basically you ionize your neutral molecules with lasers using Renti. So right here at the crossing point, you convert your neutrals into ions, and then you have a whole set of electrostatic lenses that accelerate those ions upwards, and these lenses, they are built such that basically you get a direct net here on a two-dimensional surface, where each position on this 2D net represents a velocity in this plane. So you directly get a map of the velocity. So you're measuring velocities with this. That's so why the velocity net image. Um, so this is how it works. You'll see the example of it later. So this is a nice animation of the experiment that I see the short photos made. So we make the conventional molecular beam. It's passed through this accelerator. This one is three meters long. There's about 300 of those electric field stages, continuously being manipulated with velocity. And then it comes out with a very well defined velocity that we have on the computer control. And then it's collided with the secondary beam of atoms or molecules. Then your ionization lasers come in, you convert into ions, and you map the velocity products onto this two dimensional screen. Yeah, so, this is how the experiment works. Okay, so what I would like to show you very brief, I don't want to go into too much detail on all those topics, but the first is to just get you acquainted with these um, images is the observation of photon diffraction oscillations. I would like to spend some time with the observation of these low energy scattering resonances that I also introduced already in the introduction. Um, then a very recent experiment on low energy collisions between two molecular dipoles. And last but not least, uh, the construction of the Zeeman accelerator, the magnetic analog of the Stark accelerator, which we now use for reactive scattering. And if I forget to tell you, I would like to hear already say that most of the theory of for the experiments that we do is done by Gerrit Goedemol, Hans van der Havel, and Thijs Kamel, a new hire in our institute, uh, also in the hall in Antwerp. Okay, here you see one of those velocity net imaging images of NO radicals scattering with neon atoms. And so basically, you have to interpret this, this image as a velocity axis on the right hand axis, uh, on the left hand axis, velocity axis here on the bottom. So basically, you directly get a velocity net. And the incoming and O molecules, that, so that basically represents the incoming velocity of the molecular beam, is this solid arrow here, which ends up here. So all the molecules that end up here basically are unscattered. So this would be the initial velocity vector of our molecules. But now the molecules scatter. And due to the scattering with the neon atoms, they can get deflected. And this deflection angle is directly seen here, basically by those dashed lines. So all the molecules end up somewhere in a circle. It needs to be a circle in velocity space due to conservation of energy and angular momentum. Uh, but where they end up in this space, yeah, that's governed by the potential, by the interaction, the scattering. And so by reading out the intensity distribution along this circle, you basically directly measure the differential cross section. And so that's the beauty. Of this velocity net imaging technique. But you also see that these images actually they are still kind of blobby, yeah? So they are still kind of fat. And why are they so blobby? That is because these molecular beams, as I mentioned before, they don't have ideal velocity spreads. And all those molecules have a different velocity. So you're scattering sometimes with a molecule that is slightly faster, sometimes with a slightly slow. And so that leads to all kinds of these kind of circles. They all overlap and they lead to this fat, fat blobby image. But now if you do the same experiment, but now you pass the NO radicals through the stock accelerator before the collisions, you get this. So you nicely clean up this whole image. It becomes much more sharper in the radial direction, also in the angular direction. And you start, start seeing now some structure. You see regions of high intensity, low intensity, high intensity, low intensity, and so forth. And so what do we see here? This is just quantum diffraction of these metal waves. So basically you would see this, or interpret this experiment, as basically a quantum wave scattering off this object, the helium atom, and this just starts diffracting, diffracting. Pretty much like you're used to when light falls on a pinhole, you see a diffraction pattern on the screen. Right? This is what metal waves also do. And so by improving this resolution using the stark acceleration technology, you can really start observing these individual diffraction fringes and learn something 
about the quantum mechanical behavior underlying the scattering. And this is all of high energies, right? It was like hundreds of Kelvin, but even there you can see this quantum mechanical nature. Okay, let's move on to lower energies. So I talked about this plot before, where you see scattering resonance at these very low energies. Well, this is also what you expect to see when NO radicals are scattering with helium atoms. And so I don't want to say again too much about the scattering resonance, but basically what it is, it is that when the molecules come together at very low kinetic energy, very low temperatures, they can basically tunnel, tunnel through a centrifugal barrier that is here in the interaction potential. And this tunneling probability is actually high, but on the other side of the barrier, there happens to be a bound state. So basically the NO and helium being a hole in the bound state. Well, every time that your collision energy exactly matches the energy of such a bound state, that is where this resonance occurs, and this is exactly where one of those quantum mechanical waves really starts dominating the scattering event. And this is what we would like to be able to see. And so we set out to do this, uh, and around that time, also other people have been, been working on this. There's a beautiful experiment in Bordeaux where resonances have been measured between oxygen and H2. This is still using conventional molecular D technology. So you really see beautiful resonance field structures, and also very nice experiments at the Weizmann Institute in Israel. Uh, by Edna Ravitsius and co-workers, where they bent around a beam of metastable helium atoms to tangentially overlap another beam in order to really get very low velocity and see those resonances. But this is all in the integral cross-section. So you see now those resonances in the integral cross-section of the function of energy. But you don't directly observe these waves yet, these quantum waves. For that, actually, you can use this imaging method that I'll show you in a minute. So we set out to do this. We took our accelerator, passed molecular NO through it, now focus it with a hexafold into the interaction region, and under a very small angle, we come here with a beam of cryogenic helium in order to make the helium slow, and they scatter here at this small angle, reaching energies of about 0.15 wave number. So this is very, very low, this is indeed where you start observing the scattering resonances. And this is then what you measure. So I have to explain to you, this is, this is maybe for the special, it's not so important, but the rotational ground state of NO is the J is one half state as we call it, but actually it has two components. You have an upper component and a lower component. We call that a lambda doubler. Doesn't really matter. But what matters for the experiment is that the start accelerator only transmits molecules that are in the upper component. So this is the initial state of the experiment before the collision. And this lower component is, is basically rejected by the decelerator. So all the population in that state is gone before the collision occurs. So that state is empty. And so what now happens in the collision is due to the impact with the helium atoms, those molecules that are in the F state, the upper component, they can go down and end up in the E state, which we now can state selectively measure with our laser. So we detect molecules that arrive in this E state, which is only slightly below in energy below the F state, but we state selectively look at those molecules. And if you do that now as a function of the NO velocity, or as a function of the collision energy, you see this. You see these beautiful resonance structures with three very pronounced resonances. And these are exactly the scattering resonances that I showed you before. And actually, then you go to your theoreticians and you ask them to calculate that, yeah, because they claim a molecule with an atom we can calculate exactly, so it should be a good fit. And our theoreticians, they use the best theory that is out there, which is based on the CCFDT uh, method. Well, the quantum chemists, this is like the work of this is the gold standard. In quantum chemistry, um, and you get this, it's a good agreement, but still there is a little bit of deviation there. And this is because, well, CCFDTT actually is not sufficiently good anymore if you look at molecular collisions at this resolution. And so, in a heroic effort, they developed a new theory based on the next level of theory, CCFDTQ, where the Q stands now for quadruple excitations of the electrons. And actually, then you see you get those resonances agreement uh, a lot better. So this is again one example of trying to cycle this, right? It's of course a detail, uh, but still, you know, as, as as you go down in, in you know, as you go up in resolution, you can look at those processes in more detail. You at some point you start finding that you also need the next level of theory in order to get these results. And this is how we make progress in this field. Right? Okay, but this is again in the integral cross section. As I mentioned, actually, it's very exciting now to look at these quantum waves. How do these quantum waves manifest themselves in, for instance, differential cross section? And this is what I illustrate here. So, as these 
quantum waves come in, they scatter, and you have some certain waves that go out. But at these resonances, only a few partial waves, as we call them, these are those quantum waves on the line, the scattering event, they have a quantum number. There's, there's just uh, uh, orbital angular momentum involved in these quantum states, in these partial, in these, in these quantum waves, sorry. And so actually, if this or if this, this momentum, angular momentum has a certain value, that actually leads to a kind of a different um, angular distribution of the reporting products. And by means of this Postnet imaging, the hope was in this experiment actually to start recording this angular distribution, but you can directly see these quantum waves at work. And this is indeed what we, what we saw. So if I now go back to this resonance plot, so again, this is the input cross section we saw before, but now all the energies that are marked with this red point here, you can now park your experiment and measure the angular distribution of the products using velocity mapping. And what you then see is something very striking. So as you go from high energies all the way down to lower energies, as you sample over these resonances, well, those images are followed here. The upper row is the experiment, the lower one is the well, simulation based on this new uh, CC energy Q theory. You actually see that as you scan over these resonances, this angular distribution changes dramatically. Here you see only in, um, intensity at the right, which means forward scattered. Molecules have only deflected a little bit, but not much. But as you change the energy only one wave number, only one Kelvin, that's from here to here, from the peak of the resonance down into the valley, you see all of a sudden large backscattering and some side scattering comes in. And as you go down, you see again a very different pattern, and so forth. Well, these different patterns can be directly traced back to this interference of these individual quantum waves. And as the temperature was so low, there are not so many of those quantum waves there, but its interference actually becomes quite apparent. And you can actually directly calculate this interference from theory if you then see the yeah, So this is the lowest energy here is one, one wave number, but you can go even lower, so that's in the next slide. So you see here 0.8 wave number all the way down to 0.2 wave number, and you see nicely how this angular distribution also becomes easier, and that's simply because the number of these quantum mechanical waves is reduced, and actually in this limit of 0.2 wave numbers, you only have two waves left. Yeah, yeah. So this is for the specialist. At the very low end of this here, we have arrived at the region where we only have S and P wave, that is L equals zero and L equals one in quantum numbers. And so this is the, really the, the lowest partial waves that, that can occur. If you would go even lower, or well, you enter in pure S waves, that's really the, the lowest energy that you can get, and you really get arrived in pure quantum numbers. So we're not quite there yet, but we're really, really approaching it. Okay, so that is, I think, all I want to say about these resonances. One of the questions I get a lot when I give presentations is that people say, okay, well, it would be nice if you have now one of those beams nice on the control with this accelerator, but what about the other one? I mean, you're still scattering with this boring beam of helium atoms, which is kind of conventional technology. And so isn't that limiting then the energy that you can get at the resolution? Yeah, of course, yeah, that is true. I mean, in principle, you want to control both of the scattering parts. But as you can imagine, that it actually is far from far from trivial. Uh, but we tried, nevertheless, so we set up a research program where we now also we replace this helium beam and also try to get uh, the second beam on the control. <laughs> Uh, not just to get lower energies of higher resolutions, but in particular to uh, measure interactions between two polar molecules. Because the physics of two polar molecules interacting with each other at the very low energy is just fundamentally different from molecules interacting with an atom. And so we also really try to control the dipole dipole. And so we engineered this experiment. This is actually a, a second to start accelerator, a separate one, so we can run both experiments at the same time. So NO again is passed to this one. But now this helium beam is replaced by a beam of ammonia. So this is a conventional beam of ammonia molecule. It's, you have to make those beams by sealing these molecules in a thinner of carrier gas, in this case it's krypton, in order to make a nice beam of ammonia. Uh, but then you would basically collide your NO both with the ammonia and also with the krypton. That's not what you want. So you need to kind of separate out these krypton atoms from the heat. And we do that, it's not the second start accelerator, but that would maybe be the next step, but we Settled for now for hexapole. So basically, such a hexapole is simply like a positive lens for molecules. So you can focus molecules with such a hexapole into a point. So what we do here, we have three hexapoles in succession with a beam stop here, which is displaced on the beam axis and a diaphragm here. So the idea is that molecules they are focused around this beam stop, 
and only ammonia molecules have this dipole, so they follow the right path. Krypton atoms just bounce on the beam stop, and that's where we get rid of them. So they focus around this beam stop into this diaphragm, and they refocus back by the second hexapole into the interaction. And that's where they meet the end. And so this is the energy level diagram now of both molecules. So we have NO compared to the lowest rotational state, that is again has its lambda doublet. So this is actually in the red line here, the upper state of F parity, as we call it. And the ammonia is very complicated, complicated energy level structure, but also that we produce in the lowest rotational state, and also that has this kind of inversion uh, doublet structure, and also here we often populate the upper one by virtue of these hexagons. So this experiment worked, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, the results, but then we, we got a bit greedy and we realized, okay, um, this hexapole actually is mounted under 45 degrees with the NO axis, and of course that's limiting the temperature that you can get, uh, but now that we are able to also control the secondary beam with these hexapoles, we thought, okay, why not bending one of those hexapoles into a curvature? And basically do this merge beam that also was done in, in the, at the Weizmann Institute already by Edna Habitsi is for very different type of systems. And so we built this curved hexapole, so it's coming from the side here. For the rest of the experiment is the same. So now ammonia is used in zero, it doesn't really matter. And this, this hexapole is bent now into, into a curvature such that it basically lines up tangentially with the stark accelerator beam path. And what you now have is two molecules basically merging with each other. And if they're both at the same speed, Basically, you have zero relative velocity, that means you have to reach the very, very low kinetic energy and temperature. And that is what we were, we were after in this experiment. So here you see the results from the imaging. So again, we image here the NO radical in this, uh, in this experiment. Um, and basically, by using these, these merged beams and also these straight hexapoles, we could change the collision energy from well, the lowest we've reached is 0.08 wave number, so that's about 100 millikelvin. Uh, but you can tune it all the way up to 580 wave number, so hundreds of kelvin. So across four orders of magnitude, you can now study the behavior of these collisions. And not surprisingly, you also start finding very different mechanisms as you scan the energy over these four orders of magnitude. And so divide it up here in three segments: the very low energy regime, the intermediate energy regime, and the very high energy. So let's now look at this very high energy regime here. What you see all of a sudden is not just one ring, as you've seen in the previous experiment, but you see here now a whole series of concentric rings. And why do we see more than one ring in this experiment? Well, that's actually explainable because we are now colliding with two molecules. And as molecules come in, they collide. Now both can get rotationally excited in the molecule. And the idea of this experiment is we only detect the NO radical with our laser. So, for instance, we park our laser to detect a certain final state of NO, which is energetically accessible at this very high energy. So, we know we are detecting NO in a certain excited rotational state, but we're not detecting the ammonia in this case. We don't have an ammonia laser part in this experiment. But ammonia in this collision can get to any rotational state, right? It can do all these kind of transitions, and we don't know it. But as they go to different rotational transitions, there's energy involved here. And that means they have less kinetic energy after the collision to recoil. But that is encoded in our, in our NO velocity spectrum, which we measure with velocity net energy. And so that is what we, why we see all these concentric rings here. The outer rings correspond to the fastest NO. That means they correlate with ammonia that stayed in its own rotational ground state. These inner rings correspond to NO being detected in this state, but at the same time, ammonia in coincidence, well, excited was excited to all these higher excited rotational levels. And so basically, by measuring only, only the NO, we still get a full correlated energy distribution of two molecules. And by measuring this and comparing the theory, we can learn a lot about how these two molecules excite with respect to each other and why they do that. I won't go too much detail. Then there is this intermediate energy regime where we really found some very strange behavior of, of the scattering, which I think I will skip in, in view of the time because I would like to go to the low energy regime, which is the, I think, the most interesting result of this experiment. So if you go to the low energy regime, you see that these images now there's really only one ring left. And the reason is the energy has become now so low, there's simply not enough kinetic en energy anymore for molecules to excite to begin with. Just all the channels are closed. And so 
the OBC, as the energy goes down, is that the size of these rings gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you reach here to the point that the lowest energies, nothing happens. You basically, you're imaging the center of mass. So, arguably, you could say, well, this whole imaging, at some point, loses a little bit its beauty because there's not much to be imaged. You cannot really resolve any structure. And that is just true. It's a limit of the thing. But then, of course, you can always still measure integral cross sections. And that's what we did also at this regular energy. And you see, the result here. So as the energy goes down from 10 wave numbers all the way down to 0.8, you again see this cross section really goes only through the roof. Now it increases by fivefold, uh, but just the scattering probability goes up. And the reason for that is just two dipoles. The two dipoles have a very long way, strong interaction, and this is also what you expect. And so the blue curve here is the output of theory, and you also see the theory predicts this very nicely to the mind. And so we were quite happy until you look. At a little bit more detail, and you see it already here. So if I now zoom out at the next plot, so this is the same data, but now plotted on a log log scale. So of course our experiments end at 0.8 wave numbers. We cannot do much better than that. But in theory, of course, you can calculate anything. So in theory, you can just go down all the way to the ultra cold regime, which we call the Richter regime. And then you see something very interesting that people did not realize or found before, is that actually this, this cross section, this theory cross section here. Has a local maximum, there's a, there's a kind of a bump here, and then it goes down again. This is not what you expect, you expect this just to go up. And so, but it goes down again before it enters the Richter regime. And there are two limits here that actually do make sense. The very low energy regi uh, regime, where you have only S wave scattering, L equals zero, this is where the Richter threshold laws should hold, and Richter predicts that for these type of systems, the cross sections would scale with the energy to the power of minus one half. Well, that's this bottom line, that's also what we find. So that is reassuring. That's good. At the high energy side, actually, there's another theory, the Lange event theory, which for dipole dipole scanning predicts an energy dependence e to the power of minus two thirds. And that's also what we find theoretically and also mathematically. So that's also reassuring. Until we realize that actually this doesn't make any sense at all. Because we do have two molecules in the dipole moment, and that's why naively we think it should be larger than. But actually, and this is a very subtle argument, but it's an important argument, the molecules that we use they actually do not have a permanent dipole moment. And so what you should realize is that we should not observe this larger than model at all. And the reason for that is again this 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 this, this strange rotational structure that we have in our molecules. We have this lambda doublet in an O. An inversion doublet in ammonia, and only the upper states are populated before the collision. Well, these states have definite parity. And molecules in states that have definite parity, the expectation value for the dipole moment operator is just zero. And you can easily understand that because if you would sandwich your dipole moment operator with each of these states, and minus parity, dipole moment is minus parity, so minus times minus times minus, minus integral over all space leads to zero. So our molecules do not have a dipole moment. The dipole moment is only induced when you bring this molecule in an electric field, for instance, starting to mix these two parity states. And that's why we can actually manipulate them in the cycle accelerator to begin with. But our molecules here, they scatter in zero field. And so in zero field, this mixing of parity states simply does not occur. And so it's really weird that we see Lange event. So why actually do we see it? And that's at the same time also the, 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 the explanation why we see this kind of bump structure. The reason is as follows. If you now calculate, and this also maybe goes a little bit too much detail, but if you calculate the interaction potential between the two particles, but now as a function of the distance between the particles, so you just solve the Hamiltonian as a function of the distance and you get the energy out, basically what you see is molecules are very far apart. My argument is indeed true. The dipole moment really is zero, and so they don't see each other's dipole moment and they behave as if they have just a dispersion interaction, one over half of the six. But as the, the molecules come closer, actually, by virtue of their close proximity, they start polarizing each other, mixing these two parity states. And that's exactly what you see happening here at this, 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 this buckle point. The interaction energy goes from one over half of the six to one over half of the four. And that's exactly why we see larger than. At these high energies. At these high energies, molecules come together with a high relative velocity, they come in pro close proximity, and by virtue of that self polarization, they get a dipole dipole interaction. 
But as the molecules, or well, as the energy goes down, the molecules are further and further and further apart. And at some point, the self polarizing effect can no longer sustain itself. And that is exactly the reason why you see the bump and the cross section actually goes down. Until it has to go to reach that low energy, that's just a fundamental threshold law. So it also needs to bend around again and goes down. Yeah, and this is what we see here. Experimentally, we see maybe the onset of this, but it's mostly here. Okay, so why then did this here? We'll talk about this in the next slide in virtual environment. We'll move over there. Because I'd like to say, in one minute, um, the development of the magnetic analog of these machines. This is just a manipulation of molecules using magnetic fields, which we now call the Zeeman accelerator. Uh, we have built that over the last few years uh, in Nijmegen. It works uh, really nicely. We have the specs. It is a very simple technology, very cheap. So it consists of permanent magnets, magnets, very simple coils, and very trivial and very cheap. We like cheap. Um, electronics, so this is something that everybody should be able to build. Um, and so we got that to work. We get some very nice images with this machine. So just to, to calibrate it, we get the same resolutions with our stack accelerator. But most importantly, we can now tackle species that you cannot do with a stack accelerator, simply because not all species have an electric dipole moment. But most have, in particular radicals, had a magnetic idea. And so this machine was really constructed with the idea to start doing the reactive scattering. This is also one of the questions I got a lot. Okay, well, can't you do real chemical reactions in those things? And now we can. So this is a very first proof of principle demonstration of Zeeman decelerated sulfur atoms in a metastable single D state, scattering with D2, making real reaction, and we probe the SD radicals coming out of this reaction in this coffee machine. And this is a research effort that is led by Lyme Oldway, a new hire in our, in our department as an assistant professor who is really taking charge of this project. And she's doing extremely well. And see, you see here the first preliminary data of these reaction products, really beautiful ion images. Now it's a function of collision energy. And of course, the hope is that also here we can go all the way down to the really quantum regime, approaching zero Kelvin, and still seeing those chemical reactions and learning. learning that brings me to the end of my talk. I'd like to acknowledge all of the people that actually have done the work. And so we see that we photo the entire group uh, behind all our cross beam machines. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.